Hello and welcome to this At One With Animals Conversations to Inspire. I'm Janine Upame and these conversations are in support of the Global White Lion Protection Trust. Their website details will be in the description of this video and I would encourage you to take a look at the marvellous work they're doing for lions, land and people. My guest today is Kate Miller from South Africa. Thank you so much for joining me today, Kate. Thank you, Janine, and thank you for hosting these wonderfully inspiring talks. Mm, my pleasure. It's my calling. <laughs> Triple Gemini and all that. <laughs> so um, just to give you some background on Kate, Kate is an animal communicator, dream weaver, teacher and creative. She consults in animal communication internationally and teaches in workshops and online. She studied fine art, followed by working as a nature guide and environmental educator. She has her own children's book range called Creative Nature, weaving together the arts and science through play. And her work is expanding into rewilding with nature connection, workshops and land whispering. It just sounds amazing and I every time we've talked I just feel I feel so inspired by the way you talk about nature and your uh, the way that you understand nature and can um, and can talk about it. So thank you Janine I think it comes quite naturally to people to relate to the natural world actually with that it's a living being with more personality. And when we do that, we personalize the relationship as well, which puts us into this caring reciprocity. Hmm. And it, it opens up a whole different world beyond our like cultural perception and cultural boundaries hmm. of good and bad and what's spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you just have the most amazing way of, of talking about it almost like you are weaving this web and it somehow it takes when I listen to you talking it takes me into I'm there with you I'm experiencing the land and the nature the way you do and it's yeah it's absolutely wonderful <laughs> great that's what I love doing I, started, um, I think recognizing that ability through learning drama and studying art that was more about engaging people into an emotional experience mm. than just talking about it. Oh yeah, totally. Because then when you need to really feel an experience yes. rather than just hear it, you need to feel it in your body. That's the way that uh, we process. And you are a cancer, aren't you? I'm, I'm correct. And yeah. so you, yeah. you do know how to process. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. So Let's start at the beginning. <laughs> right. So can you tell us some about your childhood? Well, you know, when I do think about my childhood, I definitely think about my love of just nature and animals uh, always. We, I grew up always with just lovely gardens and access to nature with, with holidays and when I visited my grandparents. And that was always a very strong and important part. So, I mean, at one stage, I think we had four cats and four dogs as well in, in the house. I got budgies from when I was actually very young, five, six years old. Mm. I think a lot of us have budgies as kids. Jules, who I talked with last time, she had budgies. I had budgies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think budgies are uh, quite a um, popular choice for for parents <laughs> whose kids say, "I want a dog, I want a dog." <laughs> yeah, it's much easier. And hamsters <laughs> and all of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So part of of my childhood. Mm. I did. You know, people ask. I I don't have any early recollections of talking with animals being mm. a child. I think I was like most kids in a home. The animals were just my friends you know mm -hmm. we had you know ups and downs of how many in the home over the years and mm -hmm. they were family members yeah 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 so you had 
quite strong um, experiences and, and connection with your two different sets of grandparents. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think the one that was Granny, Granny and Opa Farm, and Opa is the Afrikaans word for grandfather, and uh, then there was Granny and Opa River. So the one lived on a farm about an hour from Cape Town, and so we'd often visit there for holidays on the weekends. And so both of them were, you know, they were nature holidays. The the farm, especially. <laughs> I mean, I I got to go on the rounds with my grandfather, you know, to see the sheep, and there were pigsties and chickens and vegetable garden. You know, we'd walk around in ballet clothes on the pigsty walls. <laughs> And cows, it was a dairy. Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, it was quite a, a rural type of farm, you know, because I was still in the, in the 80s. And, mm -hmm. and lots of um, and natural spaces as well still on the farm. And my, my grandfather was a very quiet, like quite a watchful, beautiful person. So... Mm. I just remember like his favorite bird being the book Makiri. You know, there are memories like that that stood out, this appreciation mm. for, for nature. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And then my, uh, the Granny and Opa River, well, yeah, I mean, I think I was, I mean, I was swimming pretty much as fast as I was walking. <laughs> 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 mm. And then... Um, one of your grandmothers, she had an interesting experience. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I often wonder how that, you know, how deeply, you know, how did that influence me? I have memories. I mean, it was probably early teens, but I, I don't know actually exactly when it was. But she went to the faith healers in the Philippines because she had multiple sclerosis. And going to them was a big part of her recovery and remission. So she, twice she, she had full recovery. Yeah. And a big part of that was working with her faith healer. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really spoken about, but I remember later on, so it would have been my teen, seeing the photographs from her psychic surgery, which were just, I mean, it kind of blows your your mind really you know these there's the opening of the body and there's the viscous fluid um but no blood yeah so do you remember at, at the time how you thought about it can you remember any sort of conscious thoughts about that just like wow and fascinated mm. and i think this is often something with children is we don't necessarily um recognize what is the like we don't make it cognitive it's just mm. an emotional response i mean yeah. definitely sometimes we have a very like, prevalent thought but mm -hmm. quite often it's actually just an emotional mm. feeling yeah but perhaps it's kind of kept somewhere in a cache in the background as uh well i mean thinking about my you know experiences i had not which were very few and far between when i was a kid but they just got put somewhere and then called upon when the time was right. Yeah. 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 Definitely. And I have always been very, and now I actually, you know, when I teach, I teach people about hands-on healing because I explore different modalities. And over the years, it's really come, for me, it's come back to, we can all channel healing and love. Mm. And I just think about the name faith healers. That's, that's the essential principle, whatever the formal modality that goes with it, it's, we can all do it. And, you know, it's about finding a form that works for you, but mm. never underestimate the quality of just like laying on hands. Yeah. Yeah. Because we, we all have the ability to open our chakras so we if every single person has that ability mm. so if we can open our chakras we can we can channel the healing energy yeah yeah do you remember when the 
you know, animal communication as a possibility came into your awareness? Was it a conscious thought or is it something that just sort of slowly grew? Um, I want to just take a step back, Janine, and speak mm. about, you, you mentioned like opening our chakras. Mm. And I think it's very important for our audience to, to know whether you're consciously opening chakras or not, that doesn't affect your process of faith healing because you can do faith mm, healing with yeah. whatever your belief system is mm -hmm. of the body and reality. It's about, mm -hmm. it's about allowing the flow of spirit and unconditional love, I think, through us mm -hmm. and focusing your belief with intention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So back to animal communication, I just repeat that question when did it first yeah did, when did you first become aware of the possibility of being able to communicate with animals more than just you know the sort of physical face-to-face -face? oh okay well it was first with plants actually mm -hmm. so it was reading the celestine prophecy mm. and i often tell the story because it's about the power of literature and books I love that book I was 15 or 16 and I was sick at home and I read it you know front to back mm. and the chapter about them talking with plants it was this feeling of everything in my whole body and being lighting up and knowing this is reality this is how it works like this is existence mm. But then, of course, I went back to school and there isn't other supportive mm. conversation or access to that way of being. And so that's also just falls sort of into the background. Yeah. Mm. And then I became very interested. My my mum and my aunt uh, followed a lot of alternative thought and mm. they were going to workshops, healers. Um, and there were lots. My mom had a lot of books on the shelf. So, I mean, she was really doing yoga and she had a Sufi meditation group actually mm. that came to the house. So that was around very much from yeah. my, my teenage years. Mm -hmm. And I very naturally gravitated towards that with my mom. Mm. It never translated to our relationship with animals. I think consciously until I was about 21 probably when I heard about an animal communication workshop. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and Anna Breitenbach was a friend of my cousin. And so my aunt mm -hmm. sent me, um, would say, start sending me some articles about her and yeah. then a workshop came and I, I got onto it. Yeah. Mm, okay. So you were pretty young when you, when you sort of consciously stepped onto that, that path. Yeah, I was already in my 20s. I had friends who were doing learning, like actually studying full time color therapy or learning to be mm. shamans. <laughs> yeah. and my normal friends and then my very out there friends. Yeah. Yeah. I think I was actually 23. It was just after <laughs> university because mm. one of my first experiences of talking with animals was actually my uh, honors year. Uh, mm. sculptures. they were it was a sculpture they were all sculptures and and, and I was in deep relationship with them mm. they were animalistic and then afterwards I know when I went to my first workshop I was on a farm for animal communication and I got attracted to speak to the sculpture of a baboon and mm. I had this long conversation which really changed me Mm. and you know when I if I sit back I mean even now after I've been you know I've been full-time full, full -time working as a communicator for 10 years I sit back and I go like oh my gosh that sounds a bit crazy <laughs> so what sorry but it's what I believe it's there's invested energy yeah. in everything and mm. an artist in, invests energy in the object that's why we have an emotional response to art mm -hmm. greater or lesser degrees there's mm -hmm. a message there's energy and alchemy within those images of what they're saying mm -hmm. how they're relating to the people who view them and the energy of the space that they're in mm -hmm. but we're just by 
uh, using what we learn as communicators, we're mm. putting it, we're translating that energetic exchange mm. into like a rational conscious language. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, do you feel that you were communicating with a, a, ba a baboon energy or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So was it, um, was the sculpture of a specific baboon? It was just a big baboon sitting there looking out on the on the landscape. Yeah. So whether I it was that sculpture or through this image I connected to mm -hmm. the a group consciousness of the baboons mm -hmm. or maybe a specific baboon in the area. You know, I think these are the things that as you practice animal communication more, you learn to be able to identify more clearly. Mm -hmm yeah i agree like, yeah what layer or level of consciousness am i talking with yeah mm, yeah so um i did actually just forget to mention how you and i know each other well we've yeah. never physically met though we've known each other for probably about six years i think something like that um through winter our our animal communication teacher so just yeah. to mention that um yeah so um you you mentioned a little bit of art can you your experience of art school is is really fascinating I, I find it very fascinating because it's so well if you can share that uh how you felt going into art school and how you felt being there Yes, it was a very pivotal time. And I think it, it also um, helped me, you know, engage. Like we work in communication, now we work with an image mm. that we're in relationship. We can connect with soul through the image. Mm. And I was so innocently excited about going to art school because well it was part rebellion because <laughs> i i'd wanted to always work with animals but um the you know the course that school parents etc see for a child who wants to work, work with animals is be a vet <laughs> yeah that was really scary to have to there's only one university in south africa it's far away in victoria that area and um well the north of the country and to have to study science for so many years or become a zoologist mm -hmm. and that just never felt right i then thought of becoming a game ranger and then that also didn't feel right and so i'd always found happiness through art and love through art and peace so mm -hmm. i was drawing animals from when i was gosh i still have memories i mean we were at that house i must have been seven or eight and i was making absolute lifelike replicas of ninja turtles and you know drawing garfield to mm. like perfection or just sitting with wildlife books and drawing animals mm. when we went on game drive i always just uh, in a nature in a nature reserve i wanted to just sit and look you know and then everybody else wants to move on to the next event i do remember being frustrated because mm. I just wanted to watch mm. and so going to art school I, I suppose there was also I wanted to do more wildlife art but the institution itself they I suppose it was a whole world that I didn't expect or understand. And later people would say, you know, it's actually known for breaking artists more than making them. And I could see why, because as much as they say, we give you an open platform to discover yourself, there were very certain criteria that give you marks. And that was not about your, it was about your concept. So the time that I was at university, the the focus was on conceptualism and conceptual art making a statement and very little education about technique and skill and whereas actually like the old forms of apprenticeship are that you learn skill to be able to express yourself to then be able to make a statement mm. 
And so we would, all of us, would, we would have two year, two week projects. We'd spend the first week avoiding classes, freaking out about what we were going to do, thinking about it. Mm. This was the problem. And, and, and then we'd have to present our, our idea, which would then get critiqued by the lecturer <laughs> to then start making it. Mm. This was a number of the projects. And it's this whole cycle of thinking too much and getting criticized mm. rather than engaging, developing skills and then building. Mm. And it was a very difficult time for me. Yeah. I nearly left university in third year. Mm -hmm. and this is again actually where baboons come in I went to an old homeopath uh, Peter Fraser out of Barrydale and I told um, him and Nola my dilemma and Peter said to me you need to go back otherwise you'll never finish anything in your life which are very true words and he mm -hmm. said so go talk to Michael the big baboon <laughs> about it <laughs> sanctuary. and I did but I didn't actually know how to talk with him so I don't remember anything kind of changing happening for me I went back and I unfortunately I let myself um, how do you say instead of really expressing my way and finding my way I let myself fall into the, the needs, whatever, of the institution to please them, get marks, et cetera. Yeah. So in final year, my honors project, my the animals that I made were actually more like a graveyard of, of love. Mm. They were they were struggling, they were um, quite desperate, they were stoic, you know, they were gosh you know goats on a like on a cross mm. they they were bat battered souls but still a striving for life a striving to still live mm. and I didn't um it's interesting and I think a lot of people go through this where it's the silent anger but you can't actually say it out loud and you're struggling to find a voice. And I don't know that anybody actually saw exactly what I was saying through the art. They felt the raw emotion in it. Many people did. I remember a friend of my mom, who's a um, psychoanalyst, and she walked out of the exhibition crying, you know, from the emotion. Mm. And but at that stage of my life, I couldn't put into, I knew it was a graveyard of, mm -hmm. of animals, but I couldn't say that to the institution that's standing up. And as I'm talking to you, I realize, you know, those were my struggles. And that probably also was part of the groundwork, the foundations mm -hmm. of the work I do now, which is giving voice to animals. And many people who've battled to find their own voice really start finding their voice by helping others find their voice. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So always, I do believe we can turn any experience into rich, fertile ground for our, mm -hmm. um, for our existence now in the present, whatever it is that's happened in the past. Yeah. And you um, resolved your, uh, your animal graveyard, you turned it into yes. something else, didn't you? Yes. So the year um, afterwards, I redrew all the animals in their full vibrancy of, of life. Yeah. It must have been a huge learning experience. Yeah. And I did like big uh, charcoal, free charcoal drawings. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned uh, a, a teacher or a lecturer that you met. Um, I think that was later on or, or yeah. towards the end. And she had a very strong impression on you. Very much. Jane Alexander. And I, I don't know if she's still there, but she certainly was there for many years after I left. Mm. And she was known for her animistic work. She, she would 
combined sort of animal human elements in her sculptures mm. and she would ask one and help one bring out your own ideas rather than um just tell give you her idea or her critique of of what you're doing and you kind of have to figure it out she would really um try and nurture our own ideas yeah so what I mean the the feeling or impression that I get from what you're saying is initially it was very mental so did she was she able to um kind of teach to feel and and open your heart and listen for ideas or was it not quite that far no, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> no, no no no. I think the nature of her work is is there's a there's a very strong like raw emotional felt um mm. sense in her own work so as an artist and and she's one of South Africa's most you know many of the lecturers they're they're leading South African artists yeah okay uh, it was more that within her own work, there is a, a very strong felt and emotional mm. part. And so her engagement with the students, for me personally, she certainly helped me engage more on a felt, a felt mm. level. Mm. Yeah. But it yeah. wasn't through directly talking about it. No. This is the thing that's very important. Yeah. It wasn't through talking about it or making it. Mm. It was just through the way she was. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, I understand that because I, when I, I don't know if it was, you know, preparing for, for our uh, conversation, if it's, uh, if this is where it came up, but um, I started to think about my favorite teachers at school. Um, and, you know, you could have an idea what a favorite teacher was, but one of my favorite teachers was the strictest teacher, maths yeah. teacher, and she was so strict, which you would think that was a bit sort of bonkers, but um but she, I, I was always too scared not to do my homework. Okay. And, and that was good for me because, you know, discipline. And I talked about this with Jules. We need discipline. We all need discipline to, you know, spiritual path, meditate, doing, you know, the, and being, you know. So, so when I think back, it actually makes sense that she was, you know, someone that, who meant a lot to me at the time. <laughs> It does sound a bit bonkers, really. Yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, I think one of my favorite teachers at school also was because mm. it makes you rise up yes. to, yeah. to the occasion, to yeah. what's possible. Mm. Yeah, with with the effort by putting in effort and that, yeah that was, was always I just do the minimum amount of effort possible. <laughs> oh. Yeah um so what would you say your biggest challenge was as a kid you know so sort of up to you know sort of 18 teenage years what would you say was your biggest challenge if you don't mind sharing <laughs> I mean I think we go through many I'm not so sure about early on mm. but certainly in my teenage years it was happiness mm. I became very depressed and um, although on the outside I was high functioning, mm. I was top of the class, head of the student council, um, involved mm. in sports, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm. You know, social, had friends, all of that. But inside mm. I'd been very, very shut down. And I actually, I knew if it was for about, gosh, a good four or five years. I, did, I never cried. I didn't feel anything. So I actually started drinking mm. heavily on the weekends as well. Mm. I feel it's like I could never drink enough to get drunk yeah. and have a good time and relax like everybody else. Mm. So you're always just holding yourself the whole time. Wow. Yeah. Mm. And again, I'm sure many people listening can also relate to those times of their lives where you're watching from the outside, actually. Mm -hmm. And you're not actually, especially as I'm not necessarily sure of what's going on. Because, hey, everybody else seems fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as everyone looking at you probably thought also you were fine. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Mm. And I think this is one of the most amazing things about, you know, the time we live in now, it's that we have support to have all these conversations. Yeah. So much more access to that. Mm. And, and much more acceptable to, to have depression to, you know, it's so much more normal to talk about it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I knew when I finished school, my choices were based on, I want to be happy. Mm. It was, you know, like this thought that was just there in my head as strong yeah. as anything. And I kind of saw the options of going to, you know, many people took a gap year. I suppose my feeling about that was, oh God, I have to go work in a bar somewhere, you know, in a city that will be awful. Not happy. <laughs> it's, it's not your path to happiness. No. 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 And I went to, I went to UCT. What's that? Uh, oh, University, University of Cape Town. Town. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I, I started doing what happened oh my god I kept on getting such a bad spastic colon so like and a stomach problems which wow. I had health issues since I was young mm. but going to university and then the amount that everybody drinks there <laughs> <laughs> but I think also just the added pressure of new environments new people yeah anyway I, I was seeing alternative health people from when I was very young for my health issues and I went to the kinesiologist and she was like no this was in literally in the first semester mm -hmm. no alcohol no sugar no dairy no gluten wow wow you know which really changed the playing yeah. field your way of engaging and and that's when I really I started doing I found you know yoga classes and mm more my spiritually minded friends etc and I started finding through hiking and yoga uh, a very real sense of happiness inside of my physical body mm. yeah so when you say happiness in your physical body does that mean that your mind wasn't yet in a state of happiness but you recognized that there was happiness within you Yes. And then that influences my mind. And because I wasn't aware that I was depressed mm. as a teenager. No, I guess so this, yeah. is, this is, that's the, that is what shut down is a lot about. And you see it a lot in animals. Um, mm. It's just status quo. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yes. And in retrospect, mm. we look back and we go, oh my gosh, you know? Yeah. What was that? Yeah. Yeah. And I guess it's uh, it's describing a lot of people. I, I recognize it in myself, the drinking, starting young and, you know, thinking it was all because it was so much fun. But mm. no, not when you're a teenager and that's your that's all you can, you know, you just can't wait until the weekend because you can have a drink as a teenager. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's not healthy, is it? No, but very normal, I'm sure. <laughs> it is it's normal and yeah. it's supported and it's pushed mm -hmm. and i get very angry about this that mm. teenagers especially are not given more social sports more mm. social activities like hiking clubs environmental clubs mm. or even just social sports options where it's actually about interaction rather than just this continuum of competition and achievement mm. which the academic school is yeah and then the partying afterwards and yeah relationships and yeah 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 i think you know i, I my sort of teenage years were not were not easy yeah. um but when i you know obviously looking from the outside um but when i look at um what kids are experiencing now with um with mobile phone you know with social media like addiction yeah, yeah I just, addiction. Know, they can't do anything without the fear of it being you know shared on some form of some platform somewhere and i i can't even imagine what that is like um but i'm glad that there is a lot more access to to help to support 
yeah inspiring kids and is that is that the the children's series that you wrote was was that one of the ideas behind it is connecting children to nature Definitely. I mean, providing children and parents just with more ideas, more matter, more ways. And so the books have been created from a, the interactive books. And that's both, you know, with your games that we normally play, but also weaving in more what we call nature connection or deep ecology work, which is the experience of self in nature. And how do I connect more deeply in nature? Mm -hmm. So I often write the poems from the first person, from the animal's point, or as a child looking at the animal. Mm -hmm. uh, the games are about being a tortoise, you know, and making yourself into a tortoise. Mm -hmm. Or uh, how to stalk birds so that you can get as close as possible on the beach. So they really engage us in uh, awakening our sensory awareness Mm. and even in the second book uh, we took it further I know one biologist she just loved this game that we did which is I actually um, me and my partner who worked in the book it was exposing our children to bigger ecological terms because kids love stuff to like grapple with and bite into so we would speak about things like an ecological niche you know these are coloring in books you know it's eight-year-olds generally mm -hmm. <laughs> But how do we make it relative? So it was a story about crabs and some crabs swim, some crabs live in the sand, some under rocks. And what's your ecological niche? Where do you thrive? Where do you do best? Mm. And to have this as a conversation with your family. Mm. So by doing that, we start creating a relative expression. This is how we develop empathy is, well, what do you think the animal feels? Mm. Yeah. Oh, look, they need food and water. So do we. What is their ideal environment? What is mine? Mm. So, yeah. so helping kids see that the animals are not so different from us. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Wow. That's amazing. So what, what's been the reach for those books? I mean, who, who buys those books? So they're supplied to um, to many. We found our market was definitely more in the tourism sector. So Kruger mm -hmm. National Park, there are a couple mm -hmm. of boutique gift shops in, in Cape Town who stock us, private nature reserves, mm -hmm. um, and, and little shops, farm stalls, and that kind of thing all over. Mm -hmm. And... Although we have a lot of locals who buy them, I know they definitely, when they first came out, they did the gift, gifting mm -hmm. rounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Big time. So we've had a lovely local support from Cape Town. Mm. And they're also based on, the one is on Thamebos and the one is on our local seashore. And not just like the big creatures, but getting kids educated about like the, the specific and the species, like a deeper appreciation of, Mm. how special our ecosystems are and ecosystem thinking about how things are connected mm. yeah had you tried to get them into education anywhere in you know when i i was doing environmental education and then moved over to animal communication the books were really almost like a continuum of my you know my love of doing um ee mm. environment education and wanting to create it actually got sparked by how whether the children were at a, a rural school or the best, um, you know, private schools, mm. many of them in the lower grades couldn't identify, you know, a jackal was a fox and a, a honey badger was a badger. Mm. They weren't identifying like species as local species. Mm. And that's a lot to do with the stories, the books that we read, etc. And so how do I create media for children that really speaks to their local environment? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And that can go out there. And so we have, mm -hmm. we've donated a number of books to educational charities and mm -hmm. we're always available if, um, if any charities or environmental projects want to, put, want to purchase books, we give them very, very discounted rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we didn't, we got a little bit of funding to do the second book, but otherwise they've been, 
mm. done just on my own steam and, and then mm. Annie joined me for the second book yeah um and are there more coming out are you is it something Ooh. that you Oh, I, I can't say children's book sales are um <laughs> that they don't pay the bills <laughs> the next book <laughs> definitely passion projects yeah mm. and i haven't uh i actually injured my hand after the second book so i haven't been able to do more but it's always been on the the cards mm. to do more. oh and then we made like a magical mask series so that kids get to be different animals color in their mask and be able to be the animal yeah oh, cool. so, so i really you... want to do more but what's been interesting sorry mm -hmm. is i've also realized i think the break um which is it might be about four years now since the second one went out mm. i feel like just essential understanding about nature and some how to create almost like the new books yeah just more deeply from nature because mm -hmm. i love that writing the poems and actually feeling into the consciousness the collective consciousness of those animals and write from the animals mm. and i really allow it just to be a an expression from nature and with nature Mm. I think that capacity in me has certainly grown over the few years. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, what I, I was going to say that I, I love the idea. Kids find it easier to play. And I, I love that idea of, um, you know, it's almost like you get the, the parents get the books for the kids, but it's actually to help the parents, <laughs> the kids, you know? Yeah um yeah we but do. No, parents no. especially our generation we need to be retaught how to play very often yeah literally and given prompters and ideas and and then the child passions start naturally coming out and the natural creativity it's kind of like it's having things that prompt us into that connected space Mm. where of self-realization of self-learning we when we watch children play they often start making things up just from what they've gathered around them yeah and it's to prompt that natural space of engagement yeah mm. i also realize people used to ask me i don't actually get that many do i teach children as well mm. and i did do a few workshops for kids in the early days but more and more i know it's how we raise our children in relationship with the animals so the example we as adults and parents set mm. so and then to create empathy through how we play games how you calmly watch animals not necessarily the 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 the, the, the telepathic communicate like conversation mm. Mm. you know like learn in animal communication mm -hmm. that's absolutely essential like it's wonderful part of it but there are actually so many other parts that are just a natural part of nature connection if we want to you know mm. to call it that that support and strengthen that ability to intuitively relate with animals mm. yeah yeah um and that, I think, you know, if I think back to my childhood, uh, I mean, we had a couple of dogs when I was really young and then we got a German Shepherd when I was 11. Um, but my, uh, my parents, you know, they loved dogs. Uh, my dad and brother were allergic to cats, but um, so we had this German Shepherd and I remember um, if he went to the toilet inside, uh, my parents taught me to push his nose into the urine and tell him he was a bad boy. When I, mean, I didn't know any better, I'd, if I had have been taught to look inwards, I would have seen how that felt, which was obviously horrible. But I will, you know, I just did what I was told. And so growing up with that, they, they didn't have it, sort of any deeper awareness, which, you know, is a, that's just, that's not their fault. That's just how society was, you know, at that time. Um, but then it, you know, sort of slowly as I had my own dogs as an adult, 
Um, and I, I, I went through this, you know, learning and then sort of seeking out ways to help the dogs that I had because of health issues and, and um, physical, uh, physical health issues um, that I then started to learn that there was a different way. And, you know, that was, um, yeah, 15 14 years ago and I think you know even from that point to now how much I've learned and how different I am uh, in in relation to my understanding of animals can you can you see the same thing in in yourself I mean you're talking about the difference in the books but can you see that in yourself over the last years yeah absolutely and I think every year I'm evolving Mm -hmm. as I also understand stand the you know how we translate our intuitive and felt relationship also into how we act I mean this is so essential in any relationship you know we say I love you but how does that relate to and how I talk with you how I mm. how responsible I am in the relationship how I respond in relationship mm. that it's with how do I teach especially with a, an animal you know how do I I teach and care um, for you and certainly when I got my first dog I I had no clue you know my mum had raised and trained the dogs and it was it was clear firm uh, discipline Mm -hmm. she didn't ever raise her voice my mum was it was more kind of the voice of authority (laughs) I mean she was very fun and very playful with us but there was like a a, a very clear the line is the the line (laughs) (laughs) yeah okay and she also said she was like yeah we we got rescue dogs when we were young children and and we got like a rescue Doberman Rottweiler cross Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know we had we had a bull terrier you know we had these breeds and it's like you know there was just a clear Mm. appropriate unappropriate Mm -hmm. behavior Mm -hmm. yeah and but then you so said my I got a Maltese actually from from very young and but as you do with like little Maltesers you don't do any like training you know you they just they're part of the family and just carry them everywhere <laughs> yeah pretty much I mean she did she slept with me you know mm. we did everything together yeah yeah mm. um but certainly as I got older and I got my first dog who was also a rescue and he was already 10 months old, mm-hmm. I needed to learn about training um, mm-hmm. because it's like, how do I shape natural drives into behavior mm. that's socially integrated with our human needs, with the life that dogs are living in a, in a human society, in a society and the mm. world we're moving in. Mm. And I love learning more and more, you know, in, in every. So with dogs, it was uh, positive training and games training. Mm-hmm. And I think with cats, T-touch, learning T-touch made the world of difference for me with understanding how to relate with cats. And mm-hmm. I, I got the first T-touch book and I, I did their first workshop, but it was just about actually backing off. <laughs> Mm. although I'd had we'd had cats and we'd actually um tamed two feral cats that Mm. we then brought into our home as children Mm -hmm. so we really learned how to you know be slow from when we were kids but it was learning about you know magic ones and rubbing with the back of your hand rather than the front of your hand you know just uh, being sensitive to you know when they want to claw and fight that there are other ways of helping them relax so that they can enjoy more soft Mm. strokes Mm. so a lot of what are actually just very practical behavioral things and then with horses you know currently I'm starting to learn more and more about conscious and natural horsemanship and liberty work and you just see the difference in the horses who related this way how alive and happy they are Mm. you know the same with dogs when because I started seeing this with my own dogs especially my second dog that I got as an adult, I was now more confident in the positive training and more consistent. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I saw if I raised my voice to him for discipline, I started seeing this veil come across his eyes. Mm. Like, and he cut off from me. Yeah. And 
I was like, I don't want that. Mm. But when I only worked with positive affirmation and making focused time to, you know, people training is actually about improving our communication with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we think it's about training the dog. No, it's actually about setting up your communication. It's like quality time Mm. in a relationship. Spending time together. Yeah. Yeah. To set the tone and to make it very clear what what am I communicating to you? You're raising children. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And when I did that, I mean, he is everybody is always like, oh my God, what a rad dog. What an amazing dog. And he's so easygoing and I can really take him anywhere. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah. But it wasn't with my first dog. I thought I could just talk about stuff. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Which it kind of worked on and, and off. Definitely we could. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I had these huge breakthroughs of asking him to do things and he would simply do it. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, what just happened there? <laughs> mm. But equally, you know, having also, I think the, you know, the more animals you have and depending on the personality of the, of the animal or dog, the mm. level of training needed varies. You know, I, my first dog I actually took with me to schools. I was, when I was mm. doing environmental education. So I can definitely see how a bit more attention to the training would have made a huge difference to his life. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, I trained as a tea touch practitioner for um, companion animals, so dogs and cats. And um, there's a couple of things that I learned during that training that I use on myself. I mean, one one of the things we learn is it's, um, and the percentage has probably changed, but we used to say it's 75% the person and 25% the dog. So when when we would observe we would uh, you know when we were doing the work ourselves on our own dogs it's Mm -hmm. always 75 percent of your attention is on yourself and what are you doing and 25 percent is the dog because the dogs are so sensitive yeah you know we we did the the lead stroking and i i mean i do it now i use t-touch as it's like a part of who i am now um and you know, I remember that when we first started to do it and, you know, they've got a harness on and, you know, then then the metal hooks and then you've got the clip from the lead and, you know, and, and this idea that you're stroking the lead and somehow they're picking it up, you know, and at first that just sounded, no, there's no way. But then, the, then as you slow down and you learn and you kind of mm. perceive how sensitive they are, you know, to vibration and energy, um, it, it makes total sense to me that they can see it. And you you can do it and you can see that they've got an awareness of what you're doing. Um, but uh, small steps, doing things in small steps, breaking everything down into small steps and then also slowing down, which, you know, what you said about, you know, actually slowing down and, and watching and just looking. And I think kids are not really given permission. I think most adults probably don't have much spare time you know they're always rushing around myself included you know I'm you know I'm always saying well I've got I just don't have enough time of the day um but uh but it's so important to just spend some time slowing down and especially if you can just go outside and sit on some grass or with a tree or watch a view or something and just slow down and breathe into that it's just so 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 important and and to teach kids to do that I think that's not that I I don't have kids but that's what I think is very very important to just um to let kids feel that it's okay to just sit down and watch and look observe absolutely and having that that's a very important part of nature connection. And I'll never forget teaching, they're actually physical education students from a, a university. And I, I did a, a deep ecology training in, in Spain. 
I think I was about 26 at the time. And these were the students who, who came on the training. And, and they had the option of going to the coast where it was all just, uh, they had access to any type of like water sport, beach bar, et cetera, that they wanted. And then they came for three days to the mountain with us where they did rock climbing and we did deep ecology work with them. Mm. Again and again, so many of them would say, oh my gosh, thank you. I would choose this over like just the beach bar any time mm. because we cultivated a space of slowing down, of sharing mm. and of guided and focused activity. Mm. Mm. And community rather than just a free for all. Yeah. There's a focus on directing energy towards its, a positive, strong, healthy expression. Hmm. And like you said, the first teacher that you loved was because she was more disciplined. Yeah, we're learning to hmm. express our energy. And that's so often just what's happening with animals. They're just learning to express our energy and training is more about helping. I mean, many people don't even like to use the word training anymore. Hmm. You know, it's it's shaping or teaching. How do I express this natural energy in a, a healthy, um, integrated, you know, it's got benefits for everybody kind of way, mm -hmm. but the energy is allowed to be expressed in the room. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I so wish I could have come to one of your educational or environmental educational courses when I was a kid. Oh, I, I, you know, I do sometimes wonder, you know, if I had someone like that in my life who just was able to, to I mean, I might have ignored them and, and said, you know, I'm not interested in that. But because I didn't, I, I don't, I will never know. <laughs> Well, Janine, there are lots of opportunities always for, for rewilding these days for, oh, and, yeah. and reconnecting with child passions. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's so, um, you know, with, a, with astrology, um, when people are asking about, you know, their, their purpose, um, and I, I always say to them, what did you love doing as a kid? It's <laughs> always my first question. Yeah. What did you love doing as a kid? <laughs> yeah. Mm. so um yeah so you had a after you finished art school you shared the story or not the story but you told me very briefly about following a Jesus like character <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yes that was a definitely a lesson in paying attention to what your inner voice is actually saying. <laughs> I often learned the hard way by yeah. actually like seeing my inner voice, but my mind overriding it because I'm thinking this is good and because mm. of what other people say is good. Mm. And so I knew I shouldn't stay, but I did. Also because it was, let's face it, it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I got exposed to a lot in terms of healing and um, how within the spiritual movement, people can also be wowed by, if you want to call it the energetic skills of people. Mm. But that can be a circus in itself and a big show. It's not necessarily the alchemical change factor. Mm -mm often that actually comes with safety, reliability, and the groundedness of the practitioner, leader, healer, et cetera. And that can come from anyone in your life. Mm. And certainly what I learned in that group, well, it was wonderful because it was community and there was a liberty to talk about these things and engage with energy. But I learned a lot about that they, many of the people were from South America. So I learned a lot about shamanic practices. And again, the beauty, but also where things can get really mixed up and confused. Mm. And um, abused as mm -hmm. well. 
and and then just how you know healers can really be put on a pedestal and they really are human still yeah so where where was this was it um it wasn't in south africa or, or was it yes it was oh, he was okay. in south africa yeah yeah okay and so I lived in a, there was a, we had a community house. Uh, we moved often, quite often. We did a big road trip all over South Africa as well, doing workshops, which was very much on faith healing about mm-hmm. just ex- like letting love flow through you, you know, this mm. real love vibes. <laughs> I, you know, suddenly got this image of you dressed as a hippie, you know, and the peace sign. And, uh, yeah. It is not quite. <laughs> That's definitely on that way yeah <laughs> and they were wonderful I mean we had we had wonderful amazing this is the thing so often our memories can be filled with it's just taken me a long time to accept the duality of existence and and you know what did I again when I look back on that I got completely burnt out and mm. after the experience because I just gave my own inner authority up and my own power up mm. um but also, and I was then working for the organization, you know, free of charge. So, you know, we were all volunteering to keep it rolling, mm. but we got accommodation and, and board and those things. Mm. Um, but I was denying my own inner voice mm. the whole time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so like those type of, so there are, were huge benefits and learning curves but I have to also be very frank about the you know the the difficulties and the Hmm. abuses of power and energy yeah yeah I when I talked with Jules last time um, we talked about her you know she had 125,000 Facebook followers and it is this idea of what success looks like you know we have this idea that it that you know success is is visual and big and big numbers and lots of hoo ha and and actually um, I think the real you know the the true people I mean yes authentic people can have a, a big following of course but um, but I think like you said it's it comes quietly usually. Yeah in most cases with I'm learning quietly. more and mm. more and more about that of mm. and I think this has also always been the way I've practiced but I realize there's always this other part and that just comes from our culture but you have to go big to make an impact no mm. I actually just like quality connection yeah. actually is what builds change within the system mm. the whole system mm. And how do I, as a practitioner, live up to my beliefs? Yes, that's that's incredibly important. Yeah. That's the true work, really, isn't it? Yeah. Trans being transparent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because and being able to hold myself in the same compassion I hold. So all of my mistakes, I kind of, you know, these mistakes you look back on the roller coaster of my 20s, <laughs> which it really was with lots of different jobs lots of changes Mm. and it's given me a huge compassion and understanding and empathy but I've had to then find that for myself to then you know work with the nature of our lives Mm. which has a lot within that but we always have the opportunity to change to make choices Mm. go, hey I, I don't want to be like that anymore I want something different and having forgiveness and compassion towards the past, gosh, it's like it releases so much energy to move forward with. Mm. I think, you know, when I when I think about, you know, that like what's the meaning of life or um and, and uh, you know, I, I have for many, many years, I would question, what's my purpose? You know, what am I here to do? <laughs> um, and am I here to do this? Maybe I'm here to do this. Maybe I'm here to do that. Um, but where I am now in, in that question is, um, you know, just 
living every day, just trying to be aware and, you know, be honest with myself and just learn how to, you know, kind of how you said, be, how to be, you know, well, authentic and transparent and, and take responsibility, full responsibility for my own thoughts and actions in relation to other people. And then, you know, having compassion for other people and then recognizing I don't have it for myself. And, you know, um, you know, when the reason, probably the main reason why it took me so long to get these interviews going was the fear of making mistakes, yes. you know, and, and, other people could could say to me you know yeah no but you're just learning but for me myself you know the idea of getting out there and saying something stupid is like no 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 I'm not ready for that <laughs> and you know it doesn't change it doesn't it never got any easier the idea of making a mistake or saying something stupid it never got any easier I just realized that I kept wanting to do this, I kept wanting to do it, and the the kind of disappointment at not being brave enough to do it got stronger and stronger and stronger, and that's when I decided to do it. Okay, wow. it's not getting any better waiting, so I might as well just go out and do it. Um, so, you know, what is my purpose, you know, talking with people like this, or is my personal purpose actually to overcome the fear and do something that I have a urge to do. So and maybe all of the above. The I think it's all of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. why is there one single yeah. person? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. But again, that society is like you're going to be a doctor or a pilot or a, a fisherman or something. You know, it's like this It's what we grow up. What do you want to be when you grow up? Like, that's the words, you know. I want to be me. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is which is well that's it. not going to give you any money you know how are you going to pay the bills on that <laughs> and then whatever my work is, is is part of this expression of of all of me yes who I am as a person yes yeah part of me not who I am no. yeah yeah absolutely important distinction mm. Janine you spoke about this very thing uh, important thing about the self-doubt and mm. I know this has been an important part of the interviews as well when we were mm. chatting before I always tell my students it's like for the first few years of communicating I mean I had terrible self-doubt mm. I I would sometimes get a cold sweat when I was doing feedback with people <laughs> mm. yeah and I knew I had to do this and I knew I could do it mm -hmm. But there was very much that voice. I'd felt this voice of working with, with, if you want to say, energy, healing, and animals and creativity from, from young. I just didn't quite know how that was going to come together. Mm. <laughs> I certainly didn't know there was something called animal communication, you know, when I was mm. younger. And it was only when I actually you know, that, that anxiety that I felt doing the communications and we're well, doing the feedback, not so much the communications as doing the feedback with people, that feeling only really started getting better when I specifically addressed that anxiety of speaking up. Because I had to be honest with myself, it wasn't just about in the animal communication process. Mm. Yeah. And this is... I think this is quite an important thing for, for many of the listeners who are interested in animal communication as well, is that if, if it's self-doubt, if it's anxiety, that's, that's constantly almost, well, you, land, you find yourself procrastinating this, you know, oh my gosh, it's been three months and I just haven't gotten to my course or <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've really developed a lot more of a take the bull by the horns and go, why am I procrastinating? Mm. And then either it's kind of saying to spirit, help me, I want to get clear. You know, it's the first place you go. Mm. Okay, this is what I want. Rather than when we focus constantly on what we don't want, we actually often end up getting more of that. Yeah. When we take a breath and we say, what do I want? And I get clear on that. And I say, spirit, universe, mm. angel, the 
whatever you believe in. Mm. Maybe it's your other animals who are in spirit already or mm. your living animals and say, help me. Like, mm. I, this is what I want to do. What do I need to do next is your next important question. Mm. And then it might be, I just need to practice. I just need to show up. Or it might be, I need to actually take a break and I need to do that meditation course. Or it might be, I need to go hiking more often. I need to actually calm the schedule in my life so that I have more head space and heart space. Um, or it might be, actually, I need to get help. And so it was for me, I mean, I did all of those things. And then it was actually getting help with... Um, I've worked with various different healers uh, over the years. Right now I work with a life coach to address those mm. feelings because it's not only an animal communication that it shows up. Yeah, that's really important to say that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, because if, you're, if your focus is animal communication, it would feel like that's where that, it was just around that. But yes, of course, if you're doing anything similar, yeah talking in front of i mean i love i i used to always love talking on stage and in front of people mm. but i'd have this big build up you know beforehand <laughs> mm. yeah yeah and and i know like with winter's interview you know she also spoke about this journey with mm. the, uh, the the self-doubt that can crop up mm. sometimes mm. And certainly something that I have found, it's also just the more I practice the calm voice and taking small steps of risk. Mm. And that's also why I love doing feedback with people. It's because then you're not like just writing everything down without any direct feedback or well, there's an exchange and there's affirmation and there can be a process of clarifying a detail. Mm. Yeah, I said he or she, I'll never forget. Oh my gosh. I, I, I was, it was in my first year of practice and the message from the cat, the cat was, I think, I can't remember, not eating, like very distressed, restless. Mm -hmm. And she finished and he, the cat kept on saying like, he's back. Like she's back with him. He's back. He's back. And, um, like about her partner and not liking her partner. What landed up the he was actually her ex who just visited uh. to pick up old furniture. But <laughs> he phoned me in a state thinking her cat didn't like her current partner. Uh. <laughs> he also kind of moved back into the house. He'd moved in at the same time. Mm. So it was then learning mm. like to slow down and then I could tune into more information and clarify. And that's mm. been a very important part of my process of, mm. yeah, that, that getting clearer. Cause that's really what we want to do. It's expressing their voice. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, in my experience, that's practice. Mm. It is. And, and, and as you say, you know, if you need sort of help, with other aspects um but i also i have this thing with my mind just moves so so quickly i remember many years ago um it was one of my first case studies with winter and i was communicating with this dog and i got the image of a banana and then i didn't get anything else it was so so odd and uh, you know I talked with Winter about it and she said just just go back into the experience and slow it down and see what happens and then I got this image that there was this cube of information and the first the bit I could see of the cube was the banana but there was this massive cube of information behind yeah. it and it was how to unpack that information and um and you know setting the intention was a big part of it um and also finding my way like you say you you know you give the feedback on a on a call yeah um and what i discovered shortly after this experience when i really got into my case studies and i can't remember exactly which one it was how many i was in you know how many i was up to but i would then I had this idea that, you know, 
working on the computer, having the picture of the animal on the computer was the wrong thing because of technology and, you know, so blah, blah. But then I thought, okay, I'm going to try everything and see what works. So I'd have the picture of the animal on the screen and next to it, I'd have a box of, you know, with word, you know, to type in. And then I would just, you know, open, connect, and then I would just type. And, you know, it was like three pages of typing um, of just this kind of, you know, this flowing conversation. And, you know, this was actually, I think it was Winter's Cat, this happened with um, Sunshine, um, and then sent it to Winter. And she said, wow, yeah, that's, you know, that's all like she could relate to everything that I'd said so yeah so it was it was that I needed a way to get the information out quickly and I can touch type so that was my way that was my way of doing it and that's that's still pretty much if I if I not that I do it so often now but but if I do that's how I do it yeah. same thing picture I, type. that's actually important i also spend an hour with the animal and i just automatic write yeah yeah and then and then i do feedback live because i'm not a type touch typer <laughs> <laughs> definitely not <laughs> well i i remember you know uh, my mum was a secretary this is my story about touch typing is very quick I, my mum was a secretary and i was like i'm never going to be a secretary that's never you know no i know um, and then just before I left school, uh, you know, and I had to think, what am I, what am I going to do? Um, and I learned, I took, I learned with a book at school to touch type. <laughs> and, you know, it's just so amazing because, you know, I, I didn't want to do it because, you know, that's what secretaries did. But because I learned to touch type, it has just made life so much easier. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, never, never knew I would need it for something as wonderful as communicating with animals. But there you go. Here we go. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, we were talking about, I don't think any paths are, are straight. No. Um, <laughs> no. I can certainly look back on all of my meandering, you know, what looked like a change and meanders. I can see the richness now. And, you know, as I get older, I appreciate more the varied experiences I had. Mm -hmm. How that helps me in. Then when I found animal communication, it was mm -hmm. just, this is it. It was like mm -hmm. a, the highway sort of opened yeah and everything falls into place yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so um so okay here's a here's a question and this uh, this is something that i've um wondered about a lot and i did talk with winter about this uh in our in our session but mm -hmm. what part of the animal do you feel we are communicating with? <laughs> so what I often say is we're communicating with the personality mm -hmm. and the soul. Because mm -hmm. the soul is this, if I think about myself, I know there's a soul that has mm -hmm. greater knowing, but there's also a very strong personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we're all going to have a different interpretation of what part of us that is. Mm. But it's really more for me the, the expressive part in this life, in these relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like your vehicle of translation. It's the expression of this breed, if you're talking about dogs, and, and their needs and their drives. Mm -hmm. The soul is the part, this... I suppose for me in a more expansive and deeper and a deeper wisdom and and that often we move into these the soul communications i mean this is where i, I don't know that we can label it janine to be honest no yeah i think these words are really just to give our consciousness something mm. to to hold on to mm. Because we are essentially, I, I feel our desire is to speak to the whole being, mm -hmm. to all parts of this being, mm -hmm. their very physical needs within this life, their mm -hmm. physical existence, their personality, how they express themselves, their emotions, um, 
the ego that's that's present and ego has so much difficulty around that word so I, I actually I tend to actually just that's why I use the word personality like let's just stay away from that mm. there's so many different interpretations of it and the deeper spirit of the being and their mind their intellect their intelligence their consciousness mm. but ultimately it's all these parts that make up mm-hmm. the wholeness mm. And that when we slow down, we can really simplify to a clear communication that's not with different parts. It's simply being to being. Mm. One of the things I had trouble with um, in the, in, I don't know if it was in the beginning, but, but uh, definitely at one point was, I was able to connect to the spiritual element of the animal, less so to the grounded physical part of the animal. Um, And, and I mean, that's all, that's been my challenge because, you know, more often than not, when someone asks you to communicate with an animal, it's because of a physical challenge. Right. Um, which was my which was my challenge because um, you know I could I could definitely connect with them on a soul level on a you know sort of cosmic <laughs> level yeah but um, so what what would you say about that like are you uh, do you have experience uh, with students who have that that issue. Absolutely. And, and it's something I've needed to observe in myself because, uh, and just let me know, this is what you're talking about. When you connect to the yeah. spiritual being, it's often what I often call soul talk. It's actually their messages mm. for their people mm. or their reflections on energy. Yeah. So, and to, for me, how do I put it into language? to really recognize the animal as well Mm. and yes often a communication can be a lot uh, for a person and I think it's because we're we're we're, as communicators we're not here just to fix the animal Mm -mm. it's about actually to and it's not about telling people what to do or telling animals what to do it's about for me it feels like I'm a facilitator of relationship Mm and of animals and people hearing each other and having richer, deeper, more life-fulfilling relationships. Mm -hmm. And so part of that is recognizing the deep wisdom and soulful aspect that many people feel in their relationships. But that doesn't mean that the animal's without their physical needs. And to to always consciously check that out is, do we need to look at that for this communication? So it's, it's kind of about being, or take me to what's important. So this is our intention and focus. Um, but then having a look to see, open the conversation to other things. Hmm. Are there any other needs you have on it? You ask the question. Hmm. And important is also about what lens we look through. So um, for example, if you're only getting spiritual information, it's then always as a communicator to ask, okay, what lens am I looking through? So am I looking through that it's all only about the people? You know, is this the pattern that's starting to happen in how I'm translating mm. the information? Mm. How much do I believe in myself as able to help that animal? Mm because especially when we get to things like mirroring if they're mirroring their people's energy well what is it in the animal's experience and in their past or their makeup that's making them respond in this way to be mirroring Mm. because very important to help animals step out of the mirror as well Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are lots of different ways that we can engage to find where's my flow where's my power what's my focus with this work Mm -hmm. but I do feel especially while we're learning it's to you know look at all areas 
and to find also um, for me what's quite important it's the language that we're translating from the animals it's that it's within their language that's shared between the person and the animal mm. it's their relationship so how do i be really clear that i allow the expression the request the nuance of the communication to really be like that animal that's the type of thing they would ask for say <laughs> yeah 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 mm. and 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 really giving them a, a voice yeah and so i think it's very important practicing animal communication that we practice to be open to relate across the board practical emotional mm. like uh, mental Mm. which is the intellect because there's some animals you know, they love to talk mm. and the spiritual side yeah so if someone has a block in a certain area say the physical mm. um not being able to pick up the physical um needs as uh, for example so easily would you then say to your student you know or ask them about their relationship with their own physical self is that where you would expect or you know uh, okay. perhaps that there was an issue somehow i would actually probably ask them i would guide them during sessions to ask questions with the animal about their physical life or physical mm. needs Mm. Or I would really guide them in their practice to, I, I, I work with both really having an open field of just receiving with the animals mm -hmm. and definitely starting and, and, and asking proactive questions. Mm. Yeah. Did you have, and that definitely helped me to also, yeah. I remember one stage moving very much into the more metaphysical messages mm. and then also looking at because i know with my own dogs and my own animals it's very much about a practical relationship that makes a lot of difference mm. together with the metaphysical and spiritual mm. yeah. it is balancing it out it, it all out did you have any particular areas of challenge when you first started um hmm i um it was learning to deal with the amount of emotion that comes from the animal or well that comes with the cases yeah you know, yeah when i was learning it was all just you know it was a lot of just chatting good times <laughs> and and then as i was moving into then cases and and working with more and more serious experiences mm listening to the animals but it's also having a amount of experience yourself of how do i respond to this and mm. how do i help the animal mm. through what they're experiencing so mm. how, what do i give to the animal mm. how do i help the, the animal and the person mm. yeah so it's what do i say to the animal to help them with their life experience mm -hmm. so the healing and energy it's the way we send messages it's i mean i always have heart to hearts with animals like good chat about hey dude you know like that type of behavior that's like no 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 because <laughs> <laughs> i learned this with my dogs when i really started finding the power of sending mm. um what message am i sending out mm. you know saying to them my dog was barking at me because he wanted to go for a walk and i would just take I would just get so cross and I'd be like, you know, be a good boy, you know, sit on your floor, I'd do training and, and stuff. But he'd always then stand up and bark at me again. And then one day, I, I don't know, something opened in me to actually hear him. And the message package mm. was a feeling of guilt because, hey, he's a young dog and I'm actually, you know, he's been in sitting around all day. Mm. I'm not going up to the relationship. It was kind of like, well, why do you have a dog? <laughs> mm if you're not going to chill out you just want to work all the time if you're yeah. not going to actually enjoy this relationship mm. and so i remember just being like okay i hear you mm. please ask me nicely 
<laughs> and I sent yeah. a picture of when you bark, I just want to ignore you and shut down. But if you come and just nudge me and look at me with your big brown eyes and ask me nicely, I will drop everything for you. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that work out for you? He did that five minutes later. Yeah. Mm. literally and I nearly was like oh you know you know, pat pat and went back to my computer and suddenly I realized what had happened mm. Mm. and but you see there were different levels in that I deeply acknowledged the communication which was a spiritual metaphysical personal message mm. of hey show up to this like relationship mm. It wasn't just a request for routine. It was like, you're, you know, you're working too hard and like you're forgetting about everything else. Yeah. Mm. And, but then I gave him, offered him, it's very important. I offered him a positive, more empowering way for both of us, for him to express himself in the physicality. If I'm not listening to the, to the Maya's just knocked my water yes. out. Hi, Maya. <laughs> <laughs> so, Maya, what are you saying to Janine? <laughs> uh, something about water, perhaps. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> hey, I didn't, I didn't use my notes today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Sorry. I was going to have to. <laughs> I think she's reminding you, Janine, that you said an hour and a half, not two hours. What's the time? Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. She's like, yeah, okay, that's enough now. Yep. And I haven't got a towel. And you did that very politely, Maya. Enough work. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Um, okay. <laughs> Can you just repeat that? I'll edit this bit out. Can you just repeat that last thing that you were saying? <laughs> No, I think this is perfect, Janine. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> it is knowing the difference of what our animals are communicating to us. Oh, when yeah, they true. Or jump yeah. on our table, or you know, well, are they giving us an like like Maya is really saying, Janine, you said an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, she I guess... jumped up. She jumped up at the moment when I said I offered him a more proactive, empowering way to communicate. Yes, yes. He wasn't uh, just jumping up to, and we all know Maya is helping you with these interviews. Yeah. <laughs> Whether I like it or not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a, I must admit, I have, okay, so I do have a few notes just, you know, to <laughs> remind me. And uh, so I did notice she didn't jump up. You know, she didn't cut. I, I was very aware that she hadn't been in and laid on top of my notes like she has before. So I was like, wow, I've done a good job this time. Yes. <laughs> what a <the> time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. My animals are wonderful timekeepers for me. Yeah. Literally, when it's bedtime, you know, if you, you know. Uh, around for dinner and you know i'm starting to wane in my energy mm. and you, you know it's time to go home but you're still talking and my animals will come and bump my leg mm. and be like <laughs> time um, yeah. interesting yeah yeah they, they they bring us down to earth don't they <laughs> definitely okay very in tune with our inner Mm. our own inner voice yes they're our true voice our true voice yes. our true needs yes. and i think that's one of the really rich and this is often we ask about the more spiritual side of the communication mm. it's often that that's really the animals are so often in, in homes are so deeply invested in our like soulful well-being yeah and we must remember this doesn't mean like this utopia kind of concept because you know life goes through all sorts of challenges and sometimes we have to go through downs to have the ups and mm -hmm. um but there are many of them and this is not all of them because this is the beauty of animal communication it's about 
who is this individual and and what is what is their role in and and how do they relate you know what is our relationship mm. what is their role in the home what is their purpose in this life mm. yeah mm. yeah okay i'll leave it in uh, because i think that's a, a beautiful teaching thank you maya And thank you, Kate. But I'm not quite finished with you yet. Because <laughs> um, I just, I, I want you to just uh, talk. Oh. Uh, <laughs> she's like, uh, she's, I just, this last little bit, I promise. I just want you to talk just a little bit about what you're doing now and, you know, what your, uh, you know, how people can, you know, learn from you. Um, that sort of thing. I mean, I'll put your website address on the um, Thank you. description, but yeah. So I, um, I mean, of course it's the one-on-one -on -one consults and this actually said to people is one of the best ways that you can learn animal communication is have a communication mm -hmm. with a professional communicator mm -hmm. um, because it's not just about the experience, it's actually about the affirmation you get for your own intuition and your own feelings and thoughts yeah mm. then um you know i do i have been doing in-person workshops and now i I'm, uh, I'm i might be doing another one. i'm doing one now in september and then later on and i've started an online school finally mm. which was a big step and when we were talking about the whole self-doubt i mean i dug my heels in for ages not wanting to be online too much but the animals actually really taught me. They kept on pushing, especially this one cat who's been uh, a long-term, I say, you know, client, but they've become friends. Mm -hmm. And he was kept on saying to let us teach. Mm -hmm. You know, and he lives in London. And so the only way to do that is with the online mm -hmm. classes. Mm -hmm. And they've been so rich and so rewarding and so beautiful, really witnessing that direct learning with the animals mm. and how people grow and the animals grow by being heard at the same time yeah mm. so i've developed courses and classes so courses are just listening in and you can get the recordings or the classes are live interactions with animals yeah mm. fantastic well, thank you so much, Kate, for this. It's been enlightening as every conversation with you is. <laughs> and I just wish you all the best for these interviews. It's beautiful what you're doing. And it's like sitting around, you know, a dinner table, having a chat. And those are often the, the best, some of the best conversation. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Well, and thank you for... For being one of my guests and thank you everybody for watching and i'll see you next time